cosmology has always been a topic of fierce fascination for me. I remember as a child gazing into the night sky, poring over books about space at the library, uh, riding into the country with my uncle to see Halley's Comet with my binoculars. The work of Carl Sagan just captivated me, especially the 1997 film Contact with Jodie Foster and Matthew McConaughey. I think that it's a topic that captures the imagination of, of many of us who are intellectually curious about the world around us. And with the release of the mesmerizing images from the James Webb Space Telescope, many of us are feeling that fascination reignited. I think this is something that generally sets us non-believers apart from religious fanatics. We love the beauty and majesty and awe and wonder of the universe for its own sake, not as something to be prostituted toward the advancement of a theological agenda as apologists do. We seek to truly understand and explore the cosmic wilderness, not use it as a crutch for extrapolating arguments for a creator. This is why I find cosmological arguments for God's existence so off-putting. Rather than bask in the glory of the cosmos, apologists just make it a means to an end, an opportunistic leeching of scientific discovery. Fascination is replaced by exploitation. Take, for example, the fine-tuning argument for God. Indeed, astrophysicists tell us that the parameters of the universe are within an extremely narrow range, so that if you altered one parameter in the slightest, there would be no stars, no planets, no life, no us. We appear to live on a knife's edge of existence, leading the religious to suppose that the universe must have been finely tuned with us in mind. A grand architect, a cosmic engineer, must have dialed everything in just the right order to produce life as we know it. Science reveals God's handiwork at last. Or does it? Because there are other respects in which our universe hardly seems designed for life. A whopping 99.99999% of the cosmos is composed of a lethal radiation-filled vacuum, and the vast majority of material within it is deadly, inhospitable, or barren. Black holes, quasars, supernovae, asteroids, etc. practically guarantee that wherever life should gain a foothold, it could only do so impermanently. Even here on Earth, our existence is constantly threatened by natural disaster and disease, without even taking stock of what the cosmos has in store. Ultimately, our own sun will swell into a red giant and obliterate our planet. We too easily take for granted our brief moment in the sun, not fully appreciating or acknowledging how fleeting a glimpse it is on geological and especially cosmological timescales. As a species, we are here today, but could easily be gone tomorrow. Absent a god, it seems the only way that something so rare and vulnerable as life could exist is if the universe were so unfathomably old and large that life could happen by mere chance, however fleeting it may be. Lo and behold, we live in a universe that is 13.8 billion years old and 93 billion light years across with as many as 2 trillion galaxies, each consisting of over 100 billion stars, each of those with its own planetary system. With numbers like these, rare things can happen by chance alone, but only for a small fraction of the universe's total time span. As physicist Brian Cox notes, the arrow of time has created a bright window in the universe's adolescence during which life is possible but it's a window that won't stay open for long, as a fraction of the lifespan of the universe as measured from its beginning to the evaporation of the last black hole. Life as we know it is only possible for one thousandth of a billion billion billionth billion billion billionth billion billion billionth of a percent. 
This is the humbling reality that we face. The illusion of design persists only in that which we haven't fully grasped, the so-called fine-tuning that still defies explanation. But new discoveries may one day shed light on them, closing the gaps on an ever-receding appeal to divinity, casting it little by little into obsolescence. All the while, we must reckon with those aspects of cosmology and time that tell us how rare, fleeting, and seemingly insignificant we are in the larger scheme of things. The apologist will no doubt counter that the fine-tuning argument only asserts that the universe is life-permitting, not life-abundant. But are we really to believe that an all-powerful god, to whom life is supposedly so central, could only ache out the tiniest sliver of a fraction of a moment of the overall universe for life to exist? With only total oblivion, the eventual evaporation of every last star and planet to follow? What is more likely when we look at the bigger picture? That life is the purposeful act of an omnipotent creator who values it beyond measure? or a momentary and happenstance occurrence in a cosmos without sentience or purpose? The answer should be obvious to any rational person. As Carl Sagan said, it is far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. But if we are a cosmic accident, an insignificant blip on the grand universal radar, are our lives therefore meaningless? Yes and no. We may not matter on a cosmic scale. When we're gone, the universe will soldier on just fine without us. But purpose and meaning need not have cosmic and eternal proportions in order to be purposeful or meaningful. Our lives, our loves, the relationships we cherish, and the fond memories we make, our ambitions, goals, dreams, and accomplishments, our trials, pain, conquests, and growth, the legacies we leave, the people we touch, the ripples we make that echo out into the world around us, they mean something to us. They matter in the here and now. Meaning need not be determined by an external entity, but forged in the eye of the beholder. And a flame that flickers, even for only a short time, is no less beautiful. <laughs>